off and then you can you can take it over uh, for everyone who's joined us so far um, thanks for joining us again today at a little different time I'm glad that people caught the, the time change usually we're at nine o'clock but um, because of time change we have um, had with us from um, Washington State uh, this works out much much better for him and so the so the time change um, I think it was what uh, two or three years ago now that we started hearing about the very toxic effects that road um, that that tire wear particles were exerting on salmon in the Pacific Northwest and I think it's fair to say caught everyone's attention um, and we are thrilled to have uh, Ed Kolodje with us today to talk about his research in identifying the chemical substances that are responsible for that acute toxicity in coho salmon. And as it turns out, and I'm sure he's going to get into, other species of, of salmonid fish as well. Um, Ed tells me that uh, his last name, because I was wondering how to pronounce it, Kolodze, actually in Polish means wheeler. And so it was uh, something of uh, poetic justice that um, he found his way into doing <laughs> work on um, wheels at tire, um, tire wear particles as part of his uh, contribution to the scientific endeavor. So um, Ed is an associate professor at the University of Washington, and he has um, joint faculty appointments at the Environmental Sciences at UW Tacoma and in the Civil and en Environmental Engineering at UW Seattle. He's also a principal investigator at the Center for Urban Waters at uh, Tacoma, Washington, where he and his research group use advanced mass spec and, I like this addition, and hard work to investigate contaminant fate and transport, build effective tre treatment systems, and ensure ecosystem health. With that introduction, Ed, it is a real honor and, and a thrill to have you with us to talk about this really uh, important and um, rapidly involving area of research. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to you. All right. Um, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Let me just get um, the slideshow set up here and make sure everything looks okay. So um, do I look okay here? Uh, I have a good screen. I'm up full screen. Looking good. Okay. Yeah, um, I work in Tacoma, Washington at this uh, orange building here. This is the Center for Urban Waters. This is where our research labs are. Um, you know, this is this is Tacoma on its best day, of course, you know, with Mount Rainier big and bright in the background. And, you know, I'm sure some long lens photography was involved to make Mount Rainier look so close. It's actually, I think, probably like 50 miles away or something like that, but it's still a pretty darn big mountain. And um, I came to UW in 2014, and I've been doing a lot of work on organic contaminant fate and transport, really trying to work at the intersection of water, chemicals, and fish. And I had been doing a lot of work on agricultural runoff and endocrine disrupting steroids. And I came to UW and I was, you know, asking around and trying to figure out what sort of issues kind of needed environmental mass spectrometry. And everybody starts to tell me about how stormwater is killing coho salmon. And um, there's this phenomena going on that had been at that time observed for 20 years or so with anecdotal reports in the 1980s where coho salmon would come into urban and near urban and suburban and, you know, just creek systems where people were in the fall to spawn and they were totally fine until it rained and when it rained this would happen this is a big fight it's probably only been around for a couple of days it's up on the side she can't swim anymore the current has essentially pushed her off to the side and um this fish is going to die they exhibit any symptoms like this, they're losing equilibrium coming up on their side, that's unrecoverable. Um, even if you put this fish into perfectly clean water uh, with nothing in it, you know, except all the ions and things it needs, that this fish would not 
uh, recover. And this was first observed in the 1990s when the city of Seattle started to spend um, millions of dollars on habitat restoration. And that got people like Jay Davis and Steve Dam and uh, Catherine Lynch. These were essentially like fisheries technicians, fisheries biologists um, doing these restorations and doing post restoration monitoring. Because one of the issues, um, one of the success criteria for these habitat restoration efforts was that salmon would come back and successfully use the habitat that they built for the salmon. So they turn these channelized, you know, no spawning gravel systems into nice meander bends. They put spawning gravel out there. And sure enough, the salmon came back as intended, except that Steve Dam would be going out there, you know, and Jay, and they'd see two salmon up on their gravel that they built, and then it would rain. And the very next day, they'd find those exact same fish, you know, 100 feet downstream on their side dead. And this really got um, a bunch of people interested in looking at different systems and working hard to kind of document this because um, salmon are supposed to die after they reproduce. And so dead salmon itself is not a cause for concern. That's part of the natural life cycle. But what was happening is these salmon were dying when they were still full of eggs. They were dying before they had the chance to reproduce and it was something in the stormwater that killed them. So you had people like Nat Schultz and you know Jen McIntyre and a bunch of others out there for year after year documenting that this was occurring in multiple watersheds. Um, in some places, over 90% of the returning salmon were dying before spawning. You know, the, the most impacted watersheds have more than a 90% mortality rate from this. And it was reproducible, happening every single year, happening in multiple watersheds. So something was going on. And so this became known as urban runoff mortality syndrome. And um, starting around 2010, they started to try to figure out what it was once they knew it was reproducible. And yeah, there was a whole bunch of, you know, biology happening here that was um, definitely indicating there was an issue. And they figured out that this wasn't pathogens, it wasn't metals killing these fish, it wasn't pesticides, it wasn't PAHs, no, not ammonia, not dissolved oxygen, not any of the usual suspects. And they also observed in these same mortality events that coho salmon were more sensitive. There could be co-occurring cutthroat trout and chum salmon that survived the exact same storms that killed coho salmon. So this was kind of a, a pretty classic uh, scientific whodunit, right? And I kind of came to um, UW and the Center for Urban Waters in 2014 at this point where this was well-established was occurring, but nobody really had a clue what was going on. And I was running this high resolution mass spectrometer, which is really good for holistic screening and just kind of trying to collect data about a system without having a heck of a lot of assumptions about what you're gonna see. And so this really felt like the perfect tool for a water quality linked unexplained mortality issue. And so I started, uh, you know, I basically joined this team. I was like, hey, I can, I, I can help, I think you, I think we should collaborate. I should start collecting samples with you. Um, and, you know, basically I said the, the, the high resolution mass spectrometer essentially tries to detect it all. A and um, this machine is routinely detecting like 1,000 to 5,000 chemicals in every single water sample it looks at. And what the instrument reports is the chemical formula. And then that hard work I mentioned in my intro, it takes a lot of hard work by my group to convert those chemical formulas into chemical identities and try and figure out what the heck it is. So it's a really good instrument and platform for, you know, sort of an unbiased, holistic, broad spectrum screening about what's going on. So one of the first things we started to do in around 2015 is we tried to make a toxic in signature, right? We didn't know what the heck was killing these fish. We just tried to see what chemicals were always present if coho salmon died. And so at that time, we were uh, doing water quality analysis of a bunch of roadway runoff samples where Jen McIntyre had figured out that if you took roadway runoff from a busy road, you could re reproduce the symptomology of the mortality syndrome. So it seemed to be something in, the, in a busy road, in a roadway runoff. And that also agreed with a bunch of GIS-based multivariate statistics that said, if you had a lot of traffic, if you had a lot of busy roads in your watershed, your percentage of coho salmon that would die from this mortality event tended to be higher, right? 
So I was doing that, and then we also uh, had samples from actual field mortality events. Uh, we had a bunch of citizen science groups out there doing daily surveys, and we essentially told them if they saw sick fish to call us up, and we would jump in the car with like a sampling kit and we'd go get water. And uh, in doing that, we our instrument was telling us among the hundreds and thousands of compounds that were seen, we had these 57 chemicals that were always present if coho salmon died. So we just aggregated this as, as a mortality signature or a toxicant signature and started to understand it. And over time, we explained about 35 of those 57 detections and we explained um, up to 90% of the peak area that our instrument was detecting. And interestingly enough, nine of the top 10 compounds were also compounds we were seeing in tire rubber leachate. Because uh, at the same time, we've been working on different vehicle sources. So um, we were doing things like taking little bits of tire that we ground off the tread and just soaking them in water for 24 hours and analyzing that. And you'd see things like diphenylguanidine, right? This is a vulcanization accelerator right here. This actually cross-links the rubber. It makes your rubber strong, right? By making a lot of bonds between different uh, polymeric molecules. HMMM our highest peak area compound. This is what helps bind the rubber to the steel tread in your tire, right? So it helps that rubber steel connection. And these are just really abundant um, in the samples where coho salmon was dying. And this was really some of the first chemical validation of these um, observations that roads and traffic were highly correlated to mortality. So starting in say 2015, 2016, we just started to think a lot about tires and the impacts of tires and tire rubber on water quality and receiving waters. And this just was something that just grew and became more and more of our, our scientific research conversation. So by late fall um, 2017, Jen, who's our ecotoxicologist and is kind of my key collaborator, you know, she's been working on this now for 15 or more years. Um, we were doing, you know, Jen, Jen and her team were doing exposures of adult coho and chum at the Grover's Creek uh, tribal hatchery. So these are hatchery salmon that returned to the tribal hatchery. And uh, in, in summer of 2017, Jen had shown that a tire leachate, you know, in her lab, she said that a tire leachate was toxic to juvenile coho salmon. In part, you know, developed from our, our water quality assessments that tires are just a really important part of the the water quality impairment uh, that was happening when adult salmon died. And so these blue tubes here are packed with little bits of tire, and we essentially made 2,000 liters of tire rubber leachate uh, in this big stainless steel tank here and exposed it to adult coho and adult chum salmon. And this was our groundwater control. And if you remember, Chum salmon survived the very same storms that killed coho salmon. So this was an experiment designed to replicate, to try and see if we could replicate the differential mortality with tire leachate. And um, this was done four times. So there were 64 adult chum and coho salmon that were used for these studies. And to make a long story short here, all the controlled chum and coho essentially survived. We had one controlled coho that died when it got turned around in its tube and it was no longer aerated. Um, all of the adult chum salmon survived the tire leachate, and all of the adult coho salmon died from the tire leachate. So by late 2017, we knew that tire leachate was toxic to juvenile coho salmon, and we knew that tire leachate could replicate the differential mortality that was seen between coho and chum. Right? And so this is really what we're working off of here. And I should say that the concentration of tire leachate we made in this tank was about the same as what we see from a busy multi-lane highway, right? So this was, and I would say, 100% environmentally relevant. We weren't doing something way higher concentration than what's out in the environment. It was what our, if we match all those peak areas that our instrument sees, this was the same as what comes off a busy roadway. So we started to do uh, an effects-directed analysis or a TIE-type effort to try and identify what was toxic in that, right? So we're essentially leaching uh, tire particles into water and exposing them to some sort of chemical separation procedure, right? That's what the fractionation is. And then exposing whatever came off our fractionation procedure to juvenile coho salmon, right? So if you think of it this way, let's pretend that we had some toxic purple Kool-Aid, 
and you put it through a column where the red dye molecules stick to the column and the blue ones go through, you can then ask yourself, um, what chemicals are removed? What chemicals went through that column? And if you expose fish to what came off the column versus what came in, you can understand where the toxicity went, right? So if the input uh, solution was toxic and you put it through, and then the output solution was safe, right? None of the fish died, that would tell you to focus on the red dye molecules. That's what's toxic to the fish. But if the input concentration is toxic and the output concentration is toxic, that would tell you to focus on the blue dye molecules and the red ones were safe. You know, there was no change in the toxicity. So that's what we essentially did. And that in reality took us two and a half years and uh, involved a huge amount of hard work. Uh, there's many things I'm, I show in this, uh, I don't show in this figure that we tried and just didn't work or didn't yield any conclusive answer. Um, our controls, we did 27 positive controls of tire rubber leachate to 135 juvenile coho. Only two of them survived over that two years. We never had a single fish die in any of our solvent or exposure water controls, right? That was 125 fish. So I guess that was 25 different negative controls. Um, here's what was hard. Our tire leachate contained over 2000 chemicals in it. Most of them closely related chemically, right? So we're starting with this complex mixture of more than 2000 chemicals in it. This is what's coming off our roads, by the way. You know, this huge mixture of tire rubber chemicals. We put it through a cation exchange and XAD resin that it cut it down to about 1300. We did normal phase chromatography on a silica gel that got it to about 650 chemicals. We started to do prep scale HPLC. The 10 to 11 minute fraction was toxic off of a C18 column. That had about 225 chemicals in it. And then we went to orthogonal phases, still using reverse phase HPLC separation. The 10 to 11 minute fraction there was still toxic. It had 26 chemicals in it. And then we went to a phenyl packing on the column. The eight to nine minute fraction there was toxic and it had four chemicals present, at least by LC high resolution mass spectrometry. So that's how we went from more than 2000 chemicals in a toxic mixture to a toxic mixture that had four. And this is how we really prioritize what might be killing those fish. And our instrument was telling us to pay a lot of attention to C18, H22, N2O2. This was the big giant peak in that toxic fraction that had four LC, HRMS amenable chemicals in it. So um, all through mid to late 2019, we were looking to try and figure out the identity of C18, H22, N2O2. We weren't finding it in the environmental literature, no hits on databases, you know, just nothing was matching up. And we had been talking a lot about the possibility that the toxic compound was a transformation product, right? So we just started to look for similar chemical formulas. And that got us paying a lot of attention to 6PPB, which has a formula of C18, H24, N2. So the carbon and nitrogen are the same, the hydrogen's a little different, there's no oxygen. And finally, uh, Zhen Yu Tian, the, my postdoc, who really did the huge hard work of this separation, found a paper uh, in the industrial tire rubber literature from 1983, where when they reacted with 6-PPD with ozone, it made a C18H22N2O2 product. That was apparently the exact same mass we were looking at. And that compound called this the dinitrone product, right? So we started saying, you know, like, hey, you know, 6-PPD, once it reacts with ozone, um, makes this dinitrone product that seems to be the same exact thing that we're looking for. So I'll tell you a little bit about 6-PPD before I continue. 6-PPD uh, is an antiozonant or antioxidant compound. It prevents tires from cracking. Tire rubber is very susceptible to ground level ozone. Uh, that ozone loves the electron rich uh, double bonds in rubber, right? And so if you don't have a preservative compound in your tires, they'll get these big deep cracks when the ozone just breaks it apart over time. And uh, in the 1930s, they used to put wax on the outside of the tire and that was to prevent exactly this damage, the ozone damage. And 6-PPD was invented in the early 1950s uh, as an antiozonant for tires, 
And what it essentially does is it reacts with the ozone faster than the ozone can react with your tire rubber. And so 6-PPD is mixed throughout the tire, and over time it diffuses to the surface of the tire, and it scavenges the ozone before the ozone can break down your tire. And this is why your tires are strong. This is why they last for years or decades. This is why you can get good gas mileage from a hard tire. This is why your tires last 50,000 miles. And so every time you buy tires, you might be buying about 100 pounds of rubber. You're purchasing about one pound of 6-PPD that's mixed throughout that rubber. Commercial trucks might even be using 2% 6-PPD on that 2,000 pounds of rubber. So it's possible that commercial vehicles might have 30 to 40 pounds of 6-PPD mixed into that 18-wheeler you know, tire configuration. So um, you've probably long heard about zinc in roadway runoff coming from tires. There's just as much 6-PPD in tires as there is zinc. So we bought some industrial 6-PPD. That's what's here. This is what the tire company actually buys um, and mixes into your tires. You'll notice they prefer to sell it by the ton, right? One ton minimum order. And we ozonated it. And when you ozonate it, you get this dark layer here. That's the ozonation products. And you can actually see this in your own tires. If you go in the summertime when it hasn't rained for a couple weeks or you look at your car after it's been in the garage, you can see like a brownish dark film or dust on the outside of your tire. What you're actually looking at there is the 6-PPD ozonation products. So if you run your finger along your tire, that darkness that's on it is exactly the same as what's high up in this column that uh, when the 6-PPD reacts with ozone, it makes this dark little layer there. And sure enough, when we did that, that C18, H22, N2O2 molecule that we've been looking for was the big peak in our 6-PPD ozonation product. So we had figured out exactly where it came from, right? It was what was originally called the dinitrone, but then our NMR guy, Andre Simpson, actually assigned the oxygens at a different place in the molecule. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, via Andre's NMR analysis, we knew that this was actually a 6-PPD quinone right, that had both oxygens over in this central phenyl ring instead of the dinitrone where they're on the nitrogens. Um, so we, we synthesized a bunch of this biozonation and we gave it to fish. Um, we did these studies just before the COVID pandemic started. So I think this was February 17th or 19th of 2020. And this was an exciting and nerve wracking day for us. The, this is the first day we gave juvenile coho salmon purified 6-PPD quinone. And so starting with the parent compound 6-PPD at 450 micrograms per liter, that itself has some toxicity. That killed one coho salmon and one was sick at 24 hours. At 30 micrograms per liter of 6-PPD parent, all the coho survived. When we did the unpurified ozonation mixture, all the coho salmon died, mostly within about five hours or so. When we purified the 6-PPD quinone at 20 micrograms per liter out of that ozonation mixture, the coho salmon were getting sick in 90 minutes, and all of them were dead within five hours. Most of them dead around three hours. So that told us that we had something that was super toxic, and the transformation product was more toxic than the parent compound it came from. And we also knew from the way these coho died that we had figured it out. Here's an adult coho salmon dying after a rainstorm in the field. This is the lower Duwamish River. So if you've been to downtown Seattle, you've been within a mile or two of the, low ho, uh, of the lower Duwamish River. So here's actual mortality of an adult in the field. There's a bunch of these videos online. If you want to just look them up, there's lots of YouTube videos of this. The salmon's up on, on its side, it's circling, it's gasping for air. Here are juvenile coho salmon in the lab uh, on that day um, when we gave them purified 6-PPD quinone that we had synthesized in our, oops, um, in our lab. It'll be up on top and in a couple seconds here, you can just see it doing that exact same behavior. 
up on its side, gasping for air, dying within a few hours. This is exactly what happens in the field. So it wasn't just the chemistry telling us we had it right. It was the way these fish behaved and the time scale and all the physiological responses. So um, what's more, if we compared the LC50 values of the bulk mixtures, either uh, roadway runoff from a multi-lane highway or tire rubber wear, if we compare that to the pure chemical, we got almost the exact same LC50 value. So this told us in this case, it wasn't any crazy complex mixture phenomena. We could explain all the toxicity in these super complex, many thousands of chemicals present bulk mixtures by just focusing on the 6-BPD quinone concentration. So from this, we concluded that the 6-BPD quinone was the primary causal toxicant for the urban runoff mortality syndrome in coho salmon. And then we had a bad day. So we published all that. Um, Late in 2020, I think the, the print version came out in January of 2021. A commercial standard became available in March of 2021. We had always been using our ozone synthesized standard that we purified and you know all our absolute values were based on that. We got the commercial standard and it was a lot more red than our standard. Our standard was kind of like pinkish, right? And we saw a lot more peak area response of the um, commercial standard versus ours. So our we had been overestimating concentrations. So all of our relative concentrations were still correct, but our absolute value should have been lower than what we reported, not only for the environment, but also for the toxicity. And I think this is, you know, we still haven't 100% figured this out. We've been working on this for a couple of years now. I, I really think it's related to the quinone redox chemistry, which can be tricky. I think we polymerized something when we dried it down, but um, we had to redo our toxicity exposures. And when we did that, we found that instead of the original 800 nanogram per liter LC50 value, right? The LC50 value, the lethal concentration that kills half your population, our original estimate was 800 nanograms per liter, which is still a pretty darn toxic compound. When we redid the toxicity exposures with the commercial standard, we have an LC50 value of 95 nanograms per liter, which is incredibly toxic. In fact, 6-BPD quinone is one of the five or six most toxic chemicals to aquatic organisms ever identified in the scientific literature, as far as we could tell. Um, so essentially all our relative comparisons were correct, but the absolute values should have all floated down. There was less out in the environment and, um, it was also more toxic than we thought, right? So again, the relative is good, but the absolute values all came down. And so this is the data that we published in terms of its environmental relevance. Here's what I think you find. These are all roadway runoff samples from Seattle and Los Angeles of busy multi-lane roadways. And I think you can expect to find hundreds of nanogram per liter of 6-BPD quinone you know, this is based on the commercial standards. So again, this is the most solid quantification we know. I think hundreds of nanogram per liter is pretty typical for busy roadways with maybe some observations into the thousands. We've seen up to maybe three or four. I have a couple reports out from other groups of concentrations over 10,000 or over 10 micrograms per liter. That's pretty high, but might be feasible in a couple situations. In the receiving waters, we have concentrations near or below that 95 nanogram per liter LC50 value. So that's both from Seattle and San Francisco. So I think we'll see hundreds of nanogram per liter in the roadway runoff and typically tens of nanogram per liter, maybe getting up over 100 nanogram per liter or 200 nanogram per liter right after a storm when there's a lot of roadway runoff coming down smaller watersheds without a lot of dilution capacity. So that's what I think is pretty typical. When we look at base flow, non-runway, non-roadway runoff impacted systems, we typically see like 10 nanogram per liter or less. So that, that tends to be what we see out in the environment uh, for environmental relevance. And note, because to the best of our knowledge, 6-BPD is used in every tire in the world, that should tell you that you can expect to find 6-BPD quinone, one of its primary oxidation products in roadway runoff everywhere.
Um, the only real question is what its concentration is. And that's, you know, related to traffic and ground level ozone concentrations and probably a bunch of other variables that we don't yet fully understand. So just a few minutes here thinking about these questions of like, okay, so roadway runoff kills fish. Coho salmon in particular are highly sensitive to this. Um, there's obvious questions about how do we protect our fish? What the heck do we do about this roadway runoff, which in many, many places is completely untreated. You know, you have a lot of direct discharge of roadway runoff. We need to think about where we invest our first treatment dollars or management dollars for this system. So we've been doing things like sampling from the headwaters of a system down to the mouth during a storm to try and see where concentrations um, increase the most. So we do a lot of work in this Miller Creek watershed. Um, and sure enough, like right in here is where concentrations really spike in Miller Creek. You can see the guardrail to the multi-lane roadway. So in this Miller Creek system, we actually think if coho salmon can swim above this highway here, they probably won't die during a storm. If they're caught downstream of the highway, they probably are going to die during the storm. And what's more, this detention basin, we haven't directly sampled this, but by sampling above and below it during a storm, we think there might be sometimes really high concentrations in stagnant water, like these detention basins or the water that sits inside the stormwater collection system. Because we've seen observations in Miller Creek where just a few millimeters of rain, kind of a drizzle, barely increases the creek flow, and yet concentrations within the creek increase by like tenfold, like an order of magnitude jump. And you can only really explain that with a small volume of highly concentrated water. So recently I've been thinking a lot about stagnant water and risks of stagnant water where tire particles just sit and soak into that, into that water, um, potentially yielding some really problematic water quality concentrations in receiving waters. There's also been a lot of focus on observations of adult mortality in the fall in the Pacific Northwest. We actually think the springtime when the juveniles are in the system might be equally important. And this is something that people weren't thinking that juvenile coho salmon were dying. You know, there wasn't the same observations of a bunch of dead little fish. Uh, but actually, we think this is what's really happening. We might be losing a lot more fish in the spring. Um, this is a little skewed because this is 2020 and pandemic affected traffic patterns, but we think that there's no real difference between spring and fall. So this is when the adults are around and this is when the juveniles are around. They've already hatched out of the egg and they're down in the gravel. Um, so we think there might be a lot of mortality happening to these little fish. I'll note that when little fish die, something generally eats them within minutes to hours. And so it's actually really tough to see mortality events in little fish because they get eaten immediately. Also, um, most salmon don't actually float when they die. Uh, coho salmon, when they die, they sink to the bottom. So our presumption that a dead fish floats to the top is not actually true. It depends on kind of the swim bladder and swim bladder characteristics of the specific fish species. So coho salmon, even after a mortality event, they're surprisingly hard to find. They're down in the bottom of deep pools, they're washed under logs, they're under brush. Um, Mortality events can actually be a lot harder to see even when they're occurring and you know they're happening than you might expect. And that's something to think carefully about. We also know from some of the work that we've been doing and we're kind of in the midst of publishing now that um, we see up to 26 other transformation products when 6-PPD is ozonated. So one compound is put into tires, 6-PPD. It's discharging dozens of compounds um, including 6-PPD quinone, out to the aquatic environment. Our best estimate right now that around 10% of the 6-PPD that's added to tires is converted into 6-PPD quinone. So that's, you know, most of our data seems to fall, you know, around 10%. We have some observations up to maybe 20%, some down to 1% or 2%, but that's uh, our best estimate of the yield of 6-PPD quinone from 6-PPD upon ozonation. We also see other products like 1,3-DMBA. Um, this is basically a cleavage product of 6-PPD. We also think there's some other sources beyond 6-PPD, but we see a big similar spike, uh, very similar to the 6-PPD quinone spikes that we see after a storm. So the black dots here are the hydrograph, right? The discharge. 
The red is six PPD quinone concentrations. In this particular storm, it got up to about 100 nanograms per liter. So again, you'd expect coho salmon to be really affected here in this rising limb to near peak of the hydrograph time, time frame before the 6 ppd quinone starts to fall away over the course of a, a day or so. 1,3 uh, DMBA we think is sometimes, you know, getting up to, you know, let's say five to 20 micrograms per liter. So some of these compounds are out in the environment at a surprisingly high concentration, at least by my metrics. So that's a little bit of the story of, you know, there was these observations of coho salmon and we started to track it down and understand the tires really impact roadway runoff and associated receiving waters. And finally, you know, we're putting something in our tires, 6 ppb as a chemical preservative. It's designed to react. And when it reacts, it makes this even more toxic transformation product, 6 ppd quinone, which is everywhere in roadway runoff. So, um, in the last five minutes or so, I'll just bring up some of the key data gaps that still exist. We, we need to understand, you know, where the rubber on our roads is coming from and what happens to it and how much of it there is. Uh, is it all of us? Is it those big heavy trucks? There's some data out there that says, even though these are like 5% of the traffic, they might be responsible for a majority of the tire rubber particles out on the road because those trucks have a lot of tires and they have a lot of abrasion from the heavy road. So they're wearing tire rubber off the tires, maybe as much as 10 times faster than your passenger car does. Even electric vehicles with those heavy batteries are gonna be responsible for a lot of tire rubber wear. So this isn't gonna go away once we electrify our vehicular fleet. Ultimately, uh, we need to get to a source control. Um, space here, right? Where uh, we have something like a salmon safe tire where all the toxic chem chemicals are taken out of tires. I will say, you know, we know a lot about 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone as toxicity. We ran into some other chemicals during this study, you know, that were concerning based on the literature. They turned out to not be lethal to coho salmon, but I was personally surprised or, you know, it was one of these things of like, wow, that's a big red flag for that compound. Um, I think there's a number of things in tires to think about a little more carefully. Uh, I think I would put it that way. Um, I'm not confident that all the chemicals were used in this extremely widely dispersed product, right? Something that we just disperse all over the environment are um, completely non-toxic. And I think that's gonna be a major research issue for the next decade or, or so, I guess. Um, but in the end of the day, we need salmon safe tires. It's clear we need to do something. Um, it's not just um, the tires themselves. I think we should also think about what happens to tires after we're done using them. When we replace the tires on our car, we've only used up about 5% of their mass. So about 95% of the mass goes to some sort of disposal or reuse or recycling product where it's ending up on playing fields as crumb rubber, it's ending up in building materials. It's mixed into asphalt to make rubber modified asphalt to put back on the road. Um, we need to think about these trace chemicals and additives in these systems as well, not just the original product. So this is also an important data gap. Um, I'll mention a few key papers that if you're interested in this, I think you should be aware of. Uh, Zhang in 2021 showed it's not just six PPD. PPD antioxidants are common in a number of elastomeric products. Zhang reported six different PPD antioxidants. Both six PPD and six PPD quinone were present. And Zhang reported that six PPD quinone was present in 81% of urban particulate matter 2.5. So traffic is also blowing a lot of fine rubber particles off the road and a substantial fraction of urban uh, particulate matter is contains 6-PPD quinone and conceivably the whole portfolio of tire rubber chemicals. Uh, so I think that's pretty interesting to think about. We're breathing a lot of this stuff in and I can almost assure you we're leaching 6-PPD quinone off of these uh, atmospheric aerosols in our lungs too. Um, 
Kyle kind of followed up on this. We actually have the same data. I think we just got beat to publication. Um, there were He reported five different PPD antioxidants in urban water, air, and soil systems with corresponding PPD quinones detected for all of them. So we can expect a portfolio of PPD quinones out in the environment. And the PPD quinones were all at higher concentrations than the parent compounds, indicating they're at least they seem to be more persistent or they're hanging around longer than the parents. Um, one thing I think you should think a lot of uh, out there in Minnesota is the Shalas data set where um, he looked, this is a Canadian group, I think Saskatchewan, um, where uh, they saw some really high concentrations of 6-PPD quinone and a bunch of other tire rubber chemicals in snow melt. And so snow melt uh, was almost like higher risk than roadway runoff. It might be accumulating these um, compounds or stabilizing them in some fashion. Um, he reported concentrations up to about 1,400 nanogram per liter in roadway runoff and snow melt, including some really high concentrations of other tire wear compounds like diphenylguanidine. So I think there's just growing appreciation of um, how high concentrations can get for some of these. And we also have, uh, I'd say, relatively similar data to what I reported from now Australia, Canada, and China. So we do have good replication. And finally, the Brinkman study uh, showed that 6-PPD uh, quinone was toxic to other salmonids, notably brook and rainbow trout. Uh, brook trout had an LC50 value of about 590 nanogram per liter and rainbow trout around 1,000 nanogram per liter. So coho salmon are still the most sensitive species known at 95 nanograms per liter. Brook trout are a little behind them and rainbow trout a little behind that, but there's Right there, three salmonids within about an order of magnitude of each other. So I would say, you know, this data replicates all the ecotoxicology and demonstrates um, broader 6 PPD quinone toxicity to other salmonids. Although Brinkman also looked at, I think, sturgeon and um, Arctic char and saw no toxicity even up to solubility limits for 6 PPD quinone, which is about 35 micrograms per liter. So there seems to be um, some substantial species specific effects with respect to toxicity here. And nobody knows why that is yet. Um, so that's an area of ongoing investigation. And my last message here, um, it's right in front of us all the time, except we never see it, right? Um, I never look at the road anymore without seeing the rubber on it. And here's I-5 in downtown Seattle. And you can see these dark strips down the middle of the road. There's absolutely dirt there, and some of that's motor oil and all the other crud that drops off our cars. But a whole bunch of this dark strip is actually little bits of tire rubber that are coming off of our tires. That's blown into the middle of the lane and accumulates there. So this is one of those things that's in front of us all the time, just our eyes never notice. And I would say in the Pacific Northwest here, thousands of coho salmon have been telling us it's really important to pay attention to this stuff and what the heck it's doing to our roadway runoff and receiving water quality. I think we have a lot to learn in this space. And so that, um, that's really, I guess, my concluding message there. In the interest of time, I would say, you know, we've made it into poetry. This is the first 6BPD poem um, I'm aware of. I'm not going to give you time to read it, but if you look up Pattern of Consumption and 6BPD, this will pop up on the internet from earlier this year. Um, and I would just thank my research team who spent a ton of time and effort um, working on this over the last five or six years. In particular, Zhen Yutian did an amazing effects directed analysis and separation. He worked his butt off for, you know, two and a half, three years to figure out what the heck this thing was by splitting and splitting and splitting and working on separating that complex tire rubber mixture. And then Kathy Peter, who's kind of my postdoc before Zhen Yu, uh, really built the foundation and really was the person who got us thinking a lot about all these different tire rubber chemicals and many other people as well. Uh, we've obviously had a lot of collaborators and funders. I'm here telling the story, but it took a village of many researchers and many institutions and agencies and many supporters to do this. And there are plenty of um, references out there if you want to look things up. Um, so um, I can either send you papers or you can just look up my name and you'll find the literature around this.
Well, that's all I have for you today. Um, I'm here for questions. Yeah, we've got a couple in the chat. Um, Mike asks, and I, you kind of touched on this, but I'm wondering if maybe if you have more details. Um, why are coho salmon so much more sensitive compared to other species? Yeah, that um, that's unknown right now, and um, I think surprising to a lot of people in the toxicology community that we can see orders and orders of magnitude variation in species sensitivity, even in closely related species like chum and coho salmon. Um, Matt Schultz, you know, he works at NOAA, you know, does ecotoxicology. He said 20 years ago, if you told him that, he would have thought, he would have told you you were crazy, that two closely related salmon species would have vastly differential sensitivity. And yet, it's true. I mean, I, this, this data really questions you know, some of the use of indicator species to find toxic compounds and assumptions that closely related species have similar toxicities. I think with this system, it's clearly not the case. And the reason for that is not yet known. Um, we, you know, Jen McIntyre also has unpublished data. I would say documenting differential sensitivity across the, the five species of salmon that has substantial differences all the way from Highly sensitive to completely insensitive, even though they're closely related. So we do not know why that is. All right, we've got another question from Scott. Do you know if trout have similar sensitivity as salmon? So you also touched on yeah. that. I, I think just look at the brook and rainbow trout. You know, brook trout at 590, so they're about five to six fold less sensitive than coho, but 590 is still environmentally relevant. I mean, I think I could can. I could imagine some systems where brook trout get a lethal dose. Um, rainbow trout might be a little harder. There are about a thousand, but I will say I now have anecdotal reports of rainbow trout dying after rainstorms as well. So I have I have credible people emailing, calling me up, and being like, "I just saw a rainbow trout fish kill after a storm um, in a roadway runoff impacted system." So that you know. Um, yeah, we, we know at least three trout species right now, and I, I would expect sort of, I would not be surprised, you know, I would say this, there's 15 or 16,000 species of freshwater fish, right? Our probability of finding other sensitive fish is high. And I would say even that number of freshwater species fish that exist tell us that coho salmon might not be the most sensitive at all. There's a heck of a lot of fish that are never going to get an ecotox exposure out there. Um, I also have do have some anecdotal reports of non salmonid species dying after rainstorms. So there's there's a little there's a few observations out there at least. I'll leave it at that. All right. Um, Emma had a question: If there was no ground level ozone pollution to react with the six PPD, would we still have the six PPD Q issue? Yeah, this is a this is a good question. Uh, we're looking into the mechanism of formation for exactly this reason. Um, we don't think oxygen, molecular oxygen, makes very much. If molecular oxygen makes six PPD quinone from six PPD, it's very small. It might be the case that some other pathways, like hydroxyl radical or superoxide, which form in various ways, might also be responsible for some six PPD quinone formation. Right now, we do think the dominant pathway is ground level ozone. So if we make air pollution better, conceivably we'd make less 6-PPD quinone and our tires would last longer. Um, we just can't get ground level ozone to zero or even very low. Even in pristine areas, you know, there are um, natural organic compounds in the air that create ground level ozone. So it's not gonna go to zero. Uh, it's better in areas I suspect with less ground level ozone, but I don't think we're ever going to remove that element of air pollution because there are important natural formation pathways for ground level ozone. All right, um, question from Scott. Do you think heavy metals or other pollutants from road runoff contribute to toxicity as well? You addressed this a bit, but I'm just wondering if non-organic chem chemicals matter. Road salt in Minnesota is intense during the winter and can be high enough to add stress. Yeah, um, this is a question we don't know much about. Um, 
Jen and Nat, before I came, were doing things like exposing coho salmon to tenfold higher concentrations of metals than what's in roadway runoff and seeing no mortality. So at least via direct toxicity, metals just did not impact the coho salmon. Whether or not they can be like a cofactor, like change that 95 nanogram per liter to 50 or something, or you know, bump that up or down a little. I don't think we know yet. I think Jen is gonna Jen is maybe doing or in the midst of some studies to look at some of those road salt ionic strength type parameters, but I don't think we have any data there yet. Um I would say it's likely the bulk mixture or bulk solution floats toxicity up and down a bit, as well as things like temperature. You know, so you, you typically see some factors like this. I would be surprised if it changes toxicity levels by an order of magnitude or something really substantial, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if a factor of two or three, you know, came up or down. Um, but again, I'm not a ecotoxicologist, so um, there's a little bit of speculation based on all over there. Yeah. informed discussions there. All right, question from Tom. I would anticipate that tire makers may be resistant to change their compounds. Have you considered the runoff and if, it, if existing BMPs are effective at capturing the six PPD compounds? Yeah, and if I gave an hour and a half talk, I could put in 20 minutes of roadway runoff treatment system performance. Um, Jen has already published on this in 2016. Um, bioinfiltration, passing toxic roadway runoff through a mixture of sand and compost completely removed toxicity, and the co salmon are totally fine. Um, and our data actually shows that we can't see any 6 ppd quinone in the effluent of those systems. So if you have a treatment system like bioinfiltration, where you essentially pass through dirt or a, a porous media with a lot of possibilities for sorption, I think this toxicity problem goes away. And that's a good idea, even if we do source control and get 6 ppd out of tires, because there's a heck of a lot of constituents in roadway runoff, including some compounds that the literature would say are harmful to either fish or people. Uh, so that's a good idea. Um, I've looked at things like um, compost amended bioswales, right, where the water runs over the surface of like a lawn. And we see roughly order of magnitude removal. We see like 80 to 95% removal in systems like that. It's storm dependent, it's seasonal. You know, sometimes it works pretty well. Other times, you know, sometimes it's working up at 95% or better, which is probably enough to get you close to safe. Um, other times, you know, it's at like 75 or 80%. I've seen, you know, some of the cartridge filter systems in treatment or some of the things designed to remove metals or, you know, nutrients, some of those can have pretty low removal for 6 ppd quinone. So I do not think all treatment systems remove 6 ppd quinone. Uh, there's a lot of variability across the options, um, but treatment helps. Treatment helps. So that's, that's a take home message. If you wanna, if you have a sensitive habitat, I would say our data should be telling you that you should install some treatment. If you have a busy road next to a sensitive habitat, I think treatment's a good idea. Does Do we have any kind of idea what the half-life of 6-PPD quinone is in the environment yet? Yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, I need I need 15 people in my group, not five. Um, <laughs> I'm dying for more people in my group. Um, I don't have a good idea yet. I don't think this is something that's long-term persistent. I don't think 6-PPD quinone has some half-life that's like years or decades or anything long. We've seen it happily sit almost unchanged over the course of many, many months in the refrigerator, right? If you have some stormwater or roadway runoff sitting refrigerated, you know, at four degrees, it can live for a long time. I don't have complete confidence that some of what we see there is continually diffusing out of tire particles though. So that is a little bit of a gray area. We've seen some other systems where we think we see partial or complete removal relatively rapidly on the time scale of a few hours. So I do think those quinones are redox reactive and there's some systems probably where they crash out pretty fast. There's some other systems in data where I think they're, they could be pretty long lived, like maybe even that snowmelt system, you know, 
it might not surprise me if six PPD quinone deposited in October snow is still pretty darn happily there in April or May. That might be the case. Um, we do know that continued exposure to ozone starts to break down 6-BPD quinone, although it breaks down a lot slower than 6-BPD does, right? So it is gonna be amenable to a number of degradation processes. So right now, when I think of 6-BPD quinone, I think of half-lives in the days to weeks to maybe couple months type time period and not years or longer with some system specific elements that we don't yet understand. So that's my summary. Yeah. All right, it is 201. I don't know, we have one more question that wasn't answered, but I, I'll, I'll read it off and I don't know if Paul's still around, but um, can you identify higher risk areas where stormwater is particularly laden with this contaminant due to hyper, high percentage of pavement, vehicles, population, et cetera. I mean, I, I, think, I think of busy roads. I mean, I think if you're in a high traffic area, you know, Feist et al. is the study from the Pacific Northwest that does the landscape correlations and the GIS based, you know, what are the risk factors for mortality? And it's just, you know, when you, when you have a whole bunch of traffic and, you know, you have a busy highway with a corner or a braking area that gets a lot of cars. I think you can expect a lot of rubber deposition right there, particularly if it's a more urbanized area where ground level ozone concentrations tend to be a little higher. You're probably making more of this, uh, although I don't know if much of this is happening on the road surface itself, or this is something that's just on the outside of our tires and then our tires get wet and it washes off. There's a bunch of unknowns like that, but if you have a busy multi-lane road, this is the place where I think you're getting into hundreds of nanogram per liter, six BPD quinone in your roadway runoff. More than Do you that. Know what they're, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just, I just don't have more data than that right now. Sure. Do you know if um, the time between rain events has any effect on this? Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, um, the antecedent dry period matters. I think that gives more time for pollutants to accumulate on roads. So if it's raining every day, probably the third or fourth rainstorm has cleaner roadway runoff than day one does. But roads, we also know roads reload pretty quickly. Um, we know that if we have an interval of a few dry days between storms, it'll be enough to have toxic roadway runoff for sure. Um, so the roads reload quickly. Um, yeah. And we well, do slow of... taper over the winter too in Seattle, right? So fall tends to be higher, but when you get into spring and sometimes like the interval between storms increases, again, we're, we're not seeing crazy differences in spring versus fall storms, even though Seattle's almost completely dry all summer. So there's that to consider. Well, you know, the, the very first time I'm I heard the story of your research, I was stunned. And hearing your um, explanation of it again leaves me even more amazed at, at um, you know, the toxicity of 6-PPD quinone and possibly other chemicals as well. I mean, maybe we're just like you've said, maybe just scratching the surface in terms of the toxicity out there. And, and one of the things that it, it does seem clear to me, you know, we ignore these contaminants of emerging concern at our own peril. You know, I think there are many people out there who think of contaminants at the part per trillion level and just think, well, something at that concentration can't possibly be that much of a problem. But you have very nicely demonstrated that we should be really concerned about this and other chemicals at those kind of concentrations. And the more we can get that story out, the better. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll finish with just a quick response there, and I know we're a bit over time. When I started this in, let's say, 2014, 2015, I'm like, well, it has to be above a microgram per liter. I'm like, we got to be looking for things at the microgram per liter level to see gross mortality, right, in multiple fish. And my initial assumption was always like, well, this should light up my mass spec pretty well because it's going to be microgram per liter. And here we are talking about a 95 nanogram per liter LC50 which I never would have guessed. And I'll tell you, our most sensitive members of 
the coho population, we, we see mortality at 40 nanograms per liter. It's not 50% mortality, but our, our first fish or two dies at like a 40 nanogram per liter level, which is amazingly low. We also have super coho. Remember our positive controls? Two coho salmon out of 135 survived our positive controls. We have systems where we think we have four or five or 600 nanogram per liter, six BPD present, and a coho salmon will survive that. And just we, you know, so even within the coho population, there's at least an order magnitude difference in individuals within the exposed population. But the most sensitive ones are down at, I think, less than 50 nanograms per liter, which is pretty darn trace level. I never would have guessed that. And uh, it's been eye opening for me too. Yeah. If you have more questions, email me. That's what I'd say. Yeah, this has been just a fantastic seminar. So thanks so much for uh, agreeing to present your work and to uh, tell us about what you've been doing. This has been just really, really great and uh, certainly gives us a whole lot to think about moving forward in terms of you know how to assess our uh, environment for toxics out there and where we should be looking thanks again thank you for the opportunity yeah